Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to hope, start by saying I hope you all are staying safe and healthy wherever you're dialing in from. I'm actually at my dining table at home in Silicon Valley where things are very weird. It's quiet. Uh, I haven't seen folks on the street in weeks. Um, so by way of introduction, my name is Arjuna Costa. I'm the managing partner of Flourish Ventures and I'm responsible for our work in the emerging markets. For those of you that don't know Flourish, uh, a quick line. We're a venture firm investing in entrepreneurs whose innovations help people achieve financial health and prosperity. Uh, we work across the US, Latin America, Southeast Asia, uh, it, South Asia, and for this conversation, most importantly, in Sub-Saharan Africa. We're an evergreen fund, so we deploy patient capital with a long-term perspective. Uh, we are in the midst of um, in unprecedented times, but we're in this for the long run. Um, and from that perspective, as a venture investor with an active portfolio across Sub-Saharan Africa, we're in constant discussions with entrepreneurs across the continent. And these conversations are characterized by a high degree of uncertainty around how their businesses are going, how they're gonna come out of this pandemic-driven economic downturn, and what the funding environment will look like in the short to medium term. Rather than answer those questions one-to-one, -one, given all the travel restrictions and the lack of conferences, we thought we would bring together some of the most eminent investors in the space and create a forum for them to share their insights and views with all of you. I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Amea, who leads our work on the continent based out of London. He will do a quick introduction of the fantastic speakers who've taken their time to be with us today and jump into questions. Thanks. Thank you, Arjuna, and a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us. Again, as Arjuna acknowledged, we just wanna make sure that even as we start talking about funding and investments, we recognize how difficult this time is on a personal and emotional level. So we wish everyone who's joining us, um, we hope that you and your loved ones are safe and sound. Uh, my name is Amay and I will focus on our work in Africa. Now I'm sure most people joining this webinar know the panelists, uh, so therefore I'm gonna keep the introductions really short. Justin is an entrepreneur, an angel investor, and a co-founding partner at 4DI Capital. And with all those hats, he's really a leading light in the tech and startup scene in South Africa. Takunbo is a true veteran in investments in Africa. She's the co-founding managing partner at Alethia and also the chair at Africa Venture Capital Association. Ian is the co-founder of Andela and Flutterwave and someone who epitomizes entrepreneurship on the continent. With a knack for precise timing, he has launched a seed fund called Future Africa in the middle of April. So we'll dig into all of that. Yemi is the managing partner for Africa at TPG Growth. Prior to this, he founded an Africa focus fund at Levo where he was an early investor in some of the pioneering ventures on the continent like Pagatech and Interswitch. Panelists, thank you very much for joining us and taking out the time to have this conversation. Yemi, with your permission, let me start with you. And my question to you is this. We've seen countries across the world and Africa starting to ease lockdowns. Economically speaking, is the worst behind us? When do you anticipate the economy to bottom out? And when will the recovery kick in? And how fast will that recovery take shape? Well, thanks, uh, Amaya. It's a pleasure to, to be here with my co-panelists and uh, everybody else on the uh, webinar. Uh, you've asked the trillion dollar question. If I had an answer to that, you know, I'll be trying to figure out a way to, to make money from it. Um, but I think we're starting to see green shoots in, uh, in many countries. Um, and that's a function of a couple of things. Uh, we have countries where they've gone through an extended lockdown period and they're now uh, seeing a, a, a drastic reduction in the number of, of infections and the number of deaths, and therefore feel comfortable to open up. Uh, and within the context of Africa, I think the story is a little different uh, because for reasons that are not perfectly clear to any of us, the death rate from uh, COVID in Africa has been much, uh, much lower than what we've seen in, in, in other markets. Uh, and there are all sorts of hypotheses as to, to why that might be the case. Uh, so we see 
countries tied into uh, open back up, uh, Ghana, South Africa, Nigeria, and so forth, uh, open back up, not because they've done a fantastic job, frankly, of social distancing, uh, but one, but really for economic reasons. Uh, the reality is that these are countries that really cannot afford uh, to pay half the adult population like the UK is, is, is doing today to stay at home. And there's just no money to do that. So as a practical matter, going into this, uh, we, we never expected that the lockdown will last for very long in most African countries. Because just as a practical matter, you have people who live from day to day. If they're not out uh, earning uh, money, they can't feed their families. So there's no way you can keep the economies locked down for a very long period of time. So we're, it's not surprising that people are, are opening up. But your question was really more about the economy. Um, it's going to take a while, right? Uh, this is not going to be a V-shaped recovery in any form or fashion. Uh, uh, my, my base case is that it's going to take a couple of years uh, for most economies to sort of get back to where they were in January of this year, if we use that as, uh, as a benchmark. Uh, some might take longer, uh, frankly. Uh, but uh, as a practical matter, from the point of view of the entrepreneurs uh, on, the, on the line, the question is, what does it really mean for my business? And the, the impact of, of the pandemic and the trajectory of the recovery is obviously going to be a function of the, of the industry you're in. Uh, if you're in the, uh, the leisure business, uh, for example, uh, it's, it's going to take a long time because the, the reality is people don't have to get on a plane to go on holiday, right? There are other options for holidays. So that, that's, that's going to be one of the last sectors to recover. But if you're in the payments business, uh, for example, uh, would expect the impact to be, uh, to be relatively muted and to see a, a much quicker recovery. So the, the economies in general, I think it's going to be a while, but, but certain sub-segments will, will recover in, uh, in short order. Thank you, Yemi. Takumba, do you, do you want to weigh in do you agree with this uh, analysis, which says this is not going to be a V-shaped recovery? It's probably going to take much longer. Yemi just put a stake in the ground. Jan 22 is when things will return back to normal. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, it's definitely, I, I agree with Yemi. It's definitely not V-shaped. Um, and in fact, for me, that I'm, I might even posit that it's longer than uh, Yemi says, uh, just because um, if I even just take a country like Nigeria, you know, it's, it's also got a, an oil price issue that it's dealing with, which means that the budget that uh, was set for this year are certainly not anywhere near reality before we even layer on uh, COVID. And then we also have other diseases that we're uh, dealing with that have not had the same sort of um, airtime. But even if we just take COVID and the oil price, for me, that trough is going to go much longer than the couple of years. We're probably looking, if I, an additional six months, I'd say, to what uh, Yemi's saying, just because it's not just about uh, COVID. And for me, I, I say to uh, people that we're, we can't even be talking about post COVID, we need to be thinking about how we reimagine ourselves to live with COVID. Um, because really, before there's even a vaccine, that when, when a vaccine comes on, on stage, that's when we can even begin to think about how we begin to recover, right? Because before a vaccine, we're all going to live with this thing uh, for some time. And so if I then add for economies like um, commodity economies like Nigeria, especially oil, that extends it further. So I think that trough is going to be uh, quite flat for some time. Takunda, do you, do you anticipate that we will start recovery, won't get to pre-COVID levels, but start recovery this year? For me, again, it, it determines on when, for me, it, de it, it depends on when we get the vaccine and um, whatever else needs to come along. We need to, we're going to live with this for a while, which means that you're still going to have restrictions on travel and trade. And so long as those restrictions exist, it's going to be difficult for economies to bounce back. I certainly agree with the ME that subsectors of the economy and indeed some of our portfolio companies are in those sectors that are benefiting from the current um, situation. But until there's a vaccine, we live with this thing, 
travel and trade is restricted. And so therefore, I, I, I doubt that the recovery will be this year. That, that's, that's my base. Ian, love your perspectives. It's, it's pretty, it's not looking good. It's not looking good. Um, I mean, yes. I mean, the, the, the broad consensus is that this, um, the crisis is definitely a big one. And um, there's a lot that's going to change and that um, the prognosis is not good at a macro level. But I think for those of us who are funding innovation um, and are in the technology sector, there's a lot of reason for um, practical hope, as I like to call it. Um, the country's all resource challenges, um, as well as um, the boom economy, um, have not um, necessarily always been our friend from the innovation sector point of view, right? It made talents and companies a little bit too expensive. It um, pushed people away from investing in tech as more attractive yields could be provided by the government. Um, and now you have a situation where the twin, um, for some people evils, in my case, goods of physical distancing and an all, all resource staffed country are coming together to create one of the greatest challenges that our generation will ever witness. And the way I choose to see it is that it's an opportunity for innovators. It's um, the precise time for us to do what we do best, which is come out and solve those problems by building businesses that can transform these challenges into opportunities. And my sense is that that's really what's going to determine when and how we get out of the crisis. I don't think that it's gonna be determined by some magic date um, per se. I mean, those dates are good reference points, but anybody expecting us to recover from um, the oil price where it is um, definitely has a lot of praying to do. I don't think that's coming back in the way that we once experienced it. And like um, Ms. Ishmael said, I also don't think that COVID is going anywhere. I think we're going to have to learn to live with COVID, particularly in this part of the world. Um, and those are good things for us and for our businesses and for the opportunities that innovators have to reshape the way our worlds work. Now, one thing I also want to add is that in Africa, we have a bit of a benefit in the sense that we're not dealing with well-resourced governments and legacy infrastructure and interests. Um, we really are tabula rasa at this point. And that provides an opportunity for us to reshape the way society works. Um, right now, I don't think I've had as much access as I have in the last three weeks to decision makers and policy makers across the country as I do because from the comfort of my home, I no longer need to fly to Abuja. I sit down here, I'm talking to everybody. <laughs> um, I hope that continues for a while. And I hope that means that, you know, we can get ideas and things and policies done faster. And I think ultimately the ability of government, which frankly has not many other choices, to take our policy suggestions and move in the direction that the country needs to go right now, is ultimately what will determine recovery. So a bit of it is in our hands. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Justin, we'd love your perspective from your vantage in South Africa. Yeah, sure. Um, I think there's probably two aspects to consider, the macro and the micro. And um, I did a note to our LPs internally on some of the stuff. So I actually went and had a look at the last two crises that, you know, financial crises that hit the world and the impact on venture capital was quite interesting. Uh, the, you know, to, in 2000, we had still the biggest one where we had a frenzied peak um, and then the, the collapse of markets and the, the annual venture capital funding sort of globally dropped around 80%, um, but it bottomed out in 2002 and restarted a new uptrend. So that was about two years uh, of trough. And then the next peak was in 2008, um, and it had actually had a much shallower drop. It only BC Fund only dropped about 25%, and it was already back in a new uptrend by 2009. So that was a 
you know, about a year turnaround. So that actually surprised me because it felt, I remember it being far worse than, than you know, just based on memory, based compared to what the data actually says. So, um, you know, it will be interesting to see because the, there are really two things at play here. There's the virus itself and its impact in the real world. And then there's the structural capital markets uh, picture, which always has an impact on our asset class, whether we like it or not. And I feel like at the moment that capital markets are in a holding pattern. You know, we kind of had the big drop and then a bit of a rally, and now things are just moving sideways. And much of the impact of COVID on the economies of the world, on, on capital markets, is actually yet to be revealed. Um, so there's, there's this push-pull deflation versus inflation um, battle at the moment. Are we going to see markets continue to rally, or will there be another, another leg down? Um, so right now, we actually don't know. And I think, depending on how that plays out, will impact timelines. Um, usually when you get a big drop like this, there's normally another leg down that follows. But in this case, there's a lot of optimism. There's been huge stimulus from central banks, you know, much bigger than normal. Um, so hard to say, but I, I do think it's fair to say that, you know, we're looking at a sort of 12 to 24 months type of curve, whichever which way in terms of the macro level um, recovery. Then down at the micro, I think... Broadly, the technology benefits from this world that we're living in right now, which some of the panelists already alluded to. Um, and it does depend what sector you're in and what you're doing, but um, you know, we've seen acceleration of adoption of new tech in old industries, as an example. So let's look at agriculture, for instance. One of our companies um, you know, sells data analytics uh, products to farmers, and farmers typically have been slower to adopt new, you know, new technologies. They're typically older, not that many young people. And now, um, where technology can take take the place of, of people in the field, there's an acceleration in interest. So I think for the right technology plays, you, you see an, seeing an acceleration of, of adoption, um, you're seeing opportunity. Uh, we've been advising our companies to to be to have a cash conservation mindset but to zoom in where opportunity has emerged. Um, that's a, that's so, a good segue, Justin. I just wanted to come in and, and stick with you. Yeah. I want to shift gears sure. a little bit to how you've responded to the crisis at your fund with an eye to the investors who have joined us on this webinar. Right? What have you done? What are the steps you've taken? Uh, if you could just summarize that for us, uh, it'll help the investors. Sure. You know, in many ways, I view it as business as normal because as I wrote in, in my, this note that I did, um, venture capital is a very long-term game. I mean, the, our funds have a 10-year life, life cycle. So, you know, we're looking through the next 12 to 24 months. We're looking way further than that. So if we see an amazing technology that's got long-term value and potential, um, you know, we're, we're still interested. However, um, a lot of VC and fundraising is all about face-to-face -face meetings and relationship building and time spent in the field. And none of that can happen right now. Um, so we've, we've advised that companies have a, this cash conservation mindset, just be very cautious, um, you know, think very carefully about expenditure because it's not clear whether you will be able to raise money or not easily. Um, well, it's never easy, but you know, in the old sort of way. Um, we're, we're still looking at, at pitches and so on. We're still seeing interesting opportunities. We're not quite sure how we might uh, close some of those deals yet without being able to meet the people or visit their company and, and that's still a question mark but um, we, we've seen some companies in our portfolio manage to close rounds that were already underway and we've seen other rounds that were um, that were happening that have collapsed as well so broadly um, be cautious but where there's opportunity to widen your advantage or to zoom in on an opportunity you know go, go ahead um, Companies that are well cashed up can actually uh, widen their lead at this point in time. Ian, you've said on the landing page of Future Africa that there's no time like right now to invest in Africa. And I understand you see opportunities, but help us get to grips with that. We're in the middle of a crisis. Why is this the best time to invest in Africa? Well, I mean, a lot of what my experience um, or what I'm talking about is based on my own personal experience as an entrepreneur. Um, we've been on this journey twice, both in the middle of pretty serious crisis, perhaps not as 
large as 2000 or 2008. I wasn't, I wasn't even uh, out of secondary school then. But, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, we had a small crisis in 2014, fairly local, um, with respect to currency and also Ebola at about the same time. And then that overhang also happened again in sometime about 2016, where there was another currency drop. And in both times, you know, um, despite the challenges, we were able to build a very valuable business. And the reason why is because um, I think in very frothy times, there's a lot of um, investment banking, you know, there's a lot of very smart people who are looking at what the next big trend is. And a lot of that usually brings in a lot of unwanted attention into the tech space um, and tends to make a lot of things very frothy, right? Um, and I think we've seen a little bit of that. But now I think what you're really going to see are, are a lot of people looking um, at um, technology and innovation primarily because they're deeply interested in the impact it can have on people's lives. And businesses are going to get their report cards sooner than, rather than later about whether they're actually creating the impact they promised to or not. Um, also, investors will be more discerning as capital will be scarce. And that generally means that, you know, the, the businesses that actually do get funded do have a higher bar, which is a great thing as well. So I think all those things, and in my experience, kind of give me um, a sense of what would happen because this is what always happens in a crisis. But with respect to specific sectors, I would say what we're going to experience or what we're already experiencing post-COVID is a transformation of industries that have remained resistant to change for a very long time and for no good reason. Um, I'll give you an example with real estate, right? We've talked to a number of our portfolio companies and other companies that are basically saying, reporting incredible productivity outside of the office space. And they're saying, we're not going back to the office ever again. So, but there are elements of, you know, people are still gonna need housing that has bandwidth, um, broadband bandwidth, and they're also gonna need housing that has power. How do you solve those problems? for people, right? Because now it's no longer just something fancy I need in my house. These are now work tools and employers are funding it. So those are two industries that excite us. There's obviously healthcare, which has always been an area of interest, but is even gonna be more of an area of interest. And the need for innovation around respiratory um, diseases and perhaps telehealth as well. Um, that's very interesting. We're very excited about some of what is going on in the education space, particularly with respect to competency-based learning. Because all of a sudden, you know, in Lagos State where I live, the, the politics are basically such that we may not actually end the school year. And I don't think parents are going to let their kids just sit at home and not go to school or do any kind of education. They're going to need new ways to engage their kids. And I think every parent has now seen how horrible a traditional education is. And I'm glad they're all getting an experience of what we suffered <laughs> all these years. But that might mean that there might be other more engaging ways to keep your child in front of a screen so you can actually get to work. And that opens an opportunity for us to build new kinds of competency-based education frameworks that allow more fun and learning to happen at the same time. There's all sorts of theses that we're exploring, like manufacturing, primary processing for agriculture. Um, and they're all going to involve some sort or the other of deep, scalable technology, even with respect to education. There's yep. obviously a big shift towards online learning. What does that mean for certain kinds of educational experiences? What does that mean for digital jobs? So these are some of the sectors we're looking at. And I'm like a kid in a candy store right now because I missed all the unpleasantness and carnage everybody's seen. All I'm seeing are opportunities to transform society and make a lot of money doing so. We, we do need some optimism at these times, so but thank you, Eve, for providing us with that. Takunbo, we're seeing a bunch of questions around how will diligence look like in this world? Are you happy to... Uh, do new deals after Zoom calls with founders? How is this going to happen? 
So in the first instance, I mean, uh, just in terms of talking about Alethea's focus, um, our focus has always been in essential sectors. I mean, um, Alethea and Flourish are on a few transactions within the financial service um, sector, which we see as essential. Healthcare is an essential service, education um, and energy. So in the first instance, we are very bullish about uh, continuing to invest in those because as we know those are all sectors that are those are the sectors where we're talking about where they might have the bounce as opposed to follow the negativity of the macro so with that in mind we are we continue to work on transactions we have a deep pipeline that we've been working on for um, over a year and that we are we're still having IC calls today we had a uh, an IC call, so we're still uh, very much working. With respect to new transactions, what we're doing is we're leveraging the relationships that we have to diligence new, entre new entrepreneurs, um, but also looking at how those um, businesses that are coming to the fold, so we have a few in healthcare where we're meeting new entrepreneurs, but their thesis matches our thesis around being able to increase the access to healthcare, whether it's telemedicine, whether it's um, access to uh, better quality drugs, whether it's even access to for pharmacies to have uh, better quality drugs, then for sure, um, you know, we, we are still very much bullish on those. And, but we're able to reach out to those entrepreneurs because they're in a network that we already know and we're able to reference with them. But we're also willing, uh, I mean, obviously we're in Lagos, so we're, we're willing to go and visit um, maintaining social distance um, rules. And what we're actually finding is um, a couple of uh, co-investors are, are asking us to lead on due diligence in some cases because they're not able to fly in from London or the US, um, East Coast or West Coast. And so we're able to go, we're able to take videos of part of our diligence so that we're able to provide a virtual experience to other investors as well. So we are still able to do physical uh, and we're leveraging existing relationships to create new relationships. And we're also working with investors to look at co-portfolio management where we're able to provide the last mile and the front line to those transactions. So we're busy. In fact, I find that because everybody now knows that they can reach you virtually, I'm having more meetings that I would, than I would typically have if I was trying to get everywhere physically, which is great. And it's, um, it's just showing that, you know, we've all been catapulted into the 21st century. Um, if you weren't using technology before, you know, you're using it now. The woman that helps me source certain materials in the marketplace, is now willing to take my um, digital order. You didn't have that before. And whether that's for tomatoes, what ha whatever you have, there's that direct line. So not just with um, technology for, the, for technology's sake, but the use of technology in traditional industries is also what excites us. And because much of essential services is still in traditional industries, we're very busy and very focused on finding those gems. And for us, we've always said, um, as we focused on essential services, that we don't, and I, I mean, I've been in technology, worked in Silicon Valley nearly 20 some years ago. I love technology, but technology can't wag the dog. The dog itself has to have a, a raison d'etre, which technology uses to um, increase the, the breadth and access to for the populace. Thank you. So we're busy. Yeah, no, that's, that, I'm sure that's music to the ears of all the entrepreneurs joining from Nigeria. So folks, uh, Alithia is open for business. The Kunbo could show up, will stay far away, and, and there might be a video camera <laughs> involved. <laughs> Yemi, I, I want to <laughs> ask you, are, are you open for business for new deals? What sectors are interesting for you now in this post-COVID world? And how will you conduct deals remotely? 
we're, we're certainly open for business. The like everybody else, we spent uh, the first six to eight weeks of this uh, pandemic uh, really focused on our portfolio, uh, making sure that portfolio companies are okay, had enough liquidity to 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 make it through. Uh, you know, whatever we considered to we and the uh, management team considered to be a reasonable uh, COVID uh, COVID budget, so to so to speak. Uh, so that's that's what we've been focused on. Uh, but now uh, we're we're starting to uh, turn attention to uh, new opportunities. Uh, the se the sectors we're looking at really are not that different again because these are sectors that um, that are really essential sectors. I think uh, similar to the Alithia approach uh, from that perspective. Uh, so so the key sectors for us uh, have always been education, energy. Food and agriculture, financial services, healthcare, and technology, and all of those uh, are, are really essential, even even in this environment. So, so we haven't changed our lens from the standpoint of the of the sectors that we're we're looking at. Uh, interestingly enough, I mean, I, I think this the sort of uncertainty we see for the next several quarters actually. Uh, argues for doing some earlier stage investing, right? Uh, because if you're, if you let, let's say, if you look at the, the the opposite side of the spectrum, if you're going to do a buyout of an existing business, uh, how do you even underwrite that at this point? Who knows what's going to happen? What price are you going to pay? You're going to need to have all sorts of structure to protect yourself in case, and and stuff. Two years, it takes three years for the business to recover, whatever it is. Well, for a newer business where you, you know you're going to be in it for seven, eight years anyway, and you're just starting to build the business, it's actually easier to do uh, early stage investments in, in this, uh, ironically, in this, uh, in this environment, because I'm not so concerned about what the numbers are going to be the next quarter or the, or the quarter after. So, so we're spending a decent amount of time uh, looking at those, those, those types of businesses as well. But for the more mature businesses, uh, I think, I mean, one can get away from the fact that you, you need to take a view on how the business uh, comes uh, comes out of the COVID situation and how it recovers. Uh, the, the, the other types of opportunities that are interesting in this environment are those that are more structured, where, again, you're not so concerned about, about the, uh, the numbers because you have, you're investing uh, in a structured instrument. Uh, the... Example I like to give of that is, is of the, the holy grail of this, of course, is Warren Buffett uh, investing a preference instrument into Goldman Sachs uh, during the uh, global financial crisis about uh, 12 years ago. So you know it's a solid business. They need cash. Uh, in the case of Goldman, uh, it's a regulated business, so, so you actually have capital requirements you need to, to meet. Um, and you can, you can help provide a capital solution to that. So things like that are, are interesting uh, for us to consider as well. Thank you. I mean, let me let me stick with you and shift gears a bit. What are you seeing? We we are getting a bunch of questions, understandably, on this topic. How are you seeing valuations change and terms change? And there are a lot of founders with us on this webinar. Where should they give? Where should they dig in? What's your advice to them? Yeah, we're we're certainly starting to see uh, changes uh, on terms, especially. Uh, less so in valuation, but we, we all know the private markets lag the public markets uh, by several months, uh, sometimes even years, uh, frankly, when the, these things happen. But what people are, in this environment, people tend to be most concerned about downside protection. Uh, so they're, they're looking for, for, for deals where they can get um, uh, liquidation preferences that are one and a half x in some cases two x, frankly, uh, to ensure that there's uh, there's downside protection, especially if they're paying uh, you know a chunky valuation. All right, so so it's going to be tough to get a, a chunky valuation and a clean deal, quote unquote, in this environment. So if you're going to get a good valuation, you probably would would get uh, unit have terms. So the, uh, where should where should entrepreneurs give Yemi? Should they take a lower valuation but get a clean deal, or vice versa? Well, how 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 confident are you about your business? You know, this, this is this is the, this is always the the, the the question, right? I mean, if it were me, uh, frankly, I would take a lower valuation and a clean deal. 
So okay. that, that, would, that, would, that, would be, that would be my preference, right? But at least there's some people who sort of believe their own PR and, uh, and I'm happy to, to take the opposite. If it works out, it's great. If it doesn't, then, then you, know, you might get washed out. At the, at the end of the day, but uh, I, I would, uh, I'd rather take a, a clean deal with a lower valuation. Justin, you've been on the other side of the table. You've, you've, um, you have scars on your back from trying to run a business in the dot-com crash. Would you, would you agree with Yemi? What, what are you willing to give him? What's your advice to founders who are fundraising this crisis? I absolutely agree with him. Um, in fact, my advice, you know, the, in the peak, the first four weeks, companies that really needed to raise money. I said to them, firstly, if you can raise money right now, you're very lucky. Secondly, don't sweat the valuation in terms now. I mean, you know, if you can raise cash, raise cash. Um, and, um, you know, we, we didn't really see um, too much of a punitive swing yet. We haven't seen it yet. I think probably more just realistic, really, whereas I think there was some inflated ideas previously. I think Yemi alluded to it. Um, ultimately, great companies will, will, will get funding. Um, now, now's not a time to quibble over every last, you know, little bit of valuation or terms, I think. And I, and I would definitely go for a cleaner deal. Um, you know, valuation is not everything. Rather get funded and, um, you know, go and press your advantage because in a time like this, if you can raise funding, it will be an advantage. And you will be able to um, uh, stretch your lead on on any other followers. So um, yeah, it's I, I I'm not sure. The other thing is that, like I said, we're in a little bit of a holding pattern right now, and some optimism is returning. But it's hard to say if there won't be another collapse in sentiment or not. Um, you know, one to two years is a long time. Anything could happen. So right now is not a bad time when there's some. Uh, upswing in sentiment to to capture that and and if you're able to raise i would say do it and raise as much as you can so Kundu, would love your perspectives here what's your advice to founders raising funds in this crisis yeah um if you have interest i mean, I, ag I agree with justin and yemi take it and run mm. what we found um where people <clears throat> initially say, you know what, we will take the conditions and then you start to discuss where the um, ranges are, the floors and the caps. And then they're like, you know, what, we'll just take the clean deal because then they realize that actually it's the future is un uncertain, right? So I definitely agree you should take the clean deal. But also, um, even if you weren't on the road before, you need to be looking at whether you have enough runway for the next 18 to 24 months. Um, you can't say that, well, we weren't planning to go out till the middle of next year. You need to be thinking about that now. Like, okay, do I have enough to take me to, um, you know, at least uh, two years of this? Um, and if you have interest, begin to bite on that interest straight away. Also begin to, the, the good thing about crisis is it focuses the mind and takes away some of that froth as that you mentioned um, earlier and also takes away the unessential. So people need to go back and um, look at their cost structure and think about what needs to come out of that cost structure and also expand the mind, reimagine themselves as to how can we expand on the revenue. That's another source of funding, right, and, and runway. So I would say, um, even before your cash is running out, even if you felt that you've got something for another uh, 12 months, begin to reimagine how you can get extra funding in to last you further and really um, buckle down on your costs and take out the non-essential. Yeah, yeah. E, <clears throat> we know there are a lot of people on this webinar who were planning to launch their ventures at this time, mm -hmm. right? They were not planning to just go out and yeah. to raise their next fund. What's your advice to people who were planning yeah. to launch and then get hit by this train? Should they still go ahead? Should they wait for better times? How do they get attention of funds who are focused on pipeline and maybe better, you know, heftier deals, safer deals? So the first thing is, yeah. So the first thing is we're, we're all, we're all, we've always been open. We just kicked off. <laughs> 
And um, there's only one of you know we're very transparent. There's only what? Sorry. <laughs> I, I was saying either there's only one future Africa as of now, but yeah, please, please, please go ahead. Yes, yes. There's just one future Africa. We're doing seed stage deals, 50k and up. We're very transparent about our sources of funding. Um, we're not raising from your typical LP because we never got you know the attention from them, and we're we we have capital to invest. We have interest in people who are giving us capital to invest. So there is money available. So if you were planning to launch a venture, what I would ask you to do though, is you wanna take a step back and ask yourself brutally and your users as well, brutally, whether there is still a need for your business in a post COVID era, right? Um, because the realities have changed and there might have been certain ways you might have planned to go to market that may no longer be necessary or relevant. Um, and, and I think it's really important that you also take the opportunity to get a top-notch team. A lot of people are letting go great people, which is amazing for people like me, because one thing I would tell you for free is that the entire business is the team at the stage I invest. Um, the market and then the team. And the market is very clear about where it's going. And we can easily figure that out. But if you don't have a great team in these times, you won't survive it, even if you have all the funding in the world. So take that time now and go get some amazing co-founders that are living in Della, that are living all these great businesses around the world and build some fantastic technology. That, that would be my advice to you. Folks, I just want to do a quick rapid response. What's the top advice you're giving your portfolio companies? Not folks who are out in the market raising funds, but just founders who are finding it hard to run the day-to-day. -day. What's the one piece of advice? Uh, Takunba, let's start with you. You're, you're top on my screen. First thing, stay alive. <laughs> you <laughs> stay alive. If you don't stay alive, your business can't be alive because you're not there. Um, building resilience, address your near-time funding uh, challenges. And, and really re-examine your value because people are going to come out of this re-evaluating what they value and what they're willing to pay for. So those Yami, are my top. Your top advice to portfolio. Focus on your stakeholders, right? So, so the stakeholders are broadly defined as your family, your employees and your customers. It's very easy when you're in the middle of a crisis to just sort of go head down. Uh, and it's difficult day to day, uh, given the liquidity challenges people have. But I always say to people, just stay in touch with your customers. Uh, despite all the, all the challenges you're, you're having, people really appreciate uh, that, that during tough times, you're staying in touch with them and, and being, being, being a part of the solution for them. Yeah, yeah. Justin, top advice. Yeah, it's mostly around survival as well. Um, you know, stick around long enough to still be in the game. Uh, really reprioritize expenditure. You know, a lot of startups are growth companies, so they're normally planning to spend money, you know, on, on upwards curves in various directions. So we've encouraged all our companies to really think carefully about what are the, the one or two focus areas they can slim down on and maybe shed a few other more peripheral opportunities and just get more focused, prioritize expenditure. E. I mean, we're telling companies, don't wait it out. Don't wait it out. Do the most radical version of your business that you know will survive past the crisis. Um, if you need to fire people, you need to do that. If you need to get out of your office, you need to do that. If you need to, you know, now is the time that every move is excused. So take that advantage and don't waste the crisis. And then also keep a hefty cash reserve. Awesome. Let me stick with you. We're, we're getting this question, which I think is quite interesting. It says, if Africa escapes the worst of the COVID crisis, will it attract more capital than other regions in the world? I think capital is a very funny thing, in my opinion, right? Like, I've come to trust the capital stack less and less as I've become more and more a recipient of it. I just don't know if I trust their judgments. So I don't think so, but I don't think that's a bad thing because what is happening, which I'm really excited about, is that the average man and woman on the street 
is actually holding quite a bit of cash. And they know, even if the capital doesn't know, that innovation is the way we get out of this crisis. But there are no institutions to take their money. Pension funds are awash. Banks are not offering the treasury bill rates they used to. They're rejecting deposits. And quite frankly, what we're trying to do at Future Africa is build the institution that replaces all these guys. Because 36% of the average Nigerian's investment, and I'll argue it will go across Africa, which is the highest proportion of their investment, is already in alternative investments, assets. And all of a sudden, you know, nothing's growing. There's a lot of government money around. Where else do you put your money? So I think that one of the things I'm super excited about is the opportunity to actually build a domestic capital base for investing in innovation and development. Yeah. And, and I think that's going to happen now. Yeah. And that's what yeah. I'm excited about. So, you know, even if the DFIs and all those guys don't come through, you know, I don't think it would affect us as much as people think it would. Jamie, what's your view on Africa as an investment destination over the next one year? Uh, I, I think it's, it's an attractive uh, investment uh, destination. Uh, I agree with uh, Ian, though. Uh, I don't think people are going to say, oh, great, Africa wasn't uh, as impacted by COVID as many of the other markets, therefore, are going to go into Africa. Uh, I think there's still going to be a lot of skepticism. Some people might say, oh, well, they're just not reporting the numbers. I mean, like on and on and on. Uh, so I, I, I certainly don't see. Uh, and people, you know, the, the, the reality is, is when people are risk off, and, and their orientation, um, then it's very, very unlikely that they're going to rush into emerging markets because you have currency issues. I mean, you have, you have other issues, even if the, um, uh, uh, and hopefully, you know, this will turn out to be the case, the human impact of, of COVID is muted right to some of the, uh, the, the other markets. Uh, but I think the fundamental drivers of the African uh, investment opportunity uh, haven't, haven't changed. Uh, uh, the, 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 the young population, uh, which hopefully is actually what's helping, uh, helping us make it through uh, this, uh, this pandemic, uh, is still there. Uh, people, people still uh, need to, to live their lives. Uh, they're interested in education. Uh, they they, they want to build a better life for themselves. So all of those drivers, I mean, nothing has really changed. Uh, mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of the day. So to the extent that people are, are back out uh, working, they're back out on the, on the streets, the fundamental driver of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the economy, uh, which is really uh, consumption uh, in many of these uh, markets is, uh, is, is gonna continue to be there. I mean, people often uh, think that the, the driver of economic growth in many of those countries is uh, resources or commodities, but that's really not the case. Like in a place like Nigeria, it's true that oil is a big driver of government revenue, uh, gov government uh, hard currency revenue specifically, but it's only 15% of GDP. So that's not mm -hmm. what's driving the growth. It's not, it's not oil. It's, it's all those people you see on the streets of Lagos and Abuja and Kano who are, who are consuming and, and creating businesses. Those are the people who are driving the, uh, the GDP and, and those people aren't going anywhere. So, Kundu, we're seeing a question which I want to direct to you. What are international LPs saying? And I know you've, you've been raising funds. Is, is Africa still a buy for LPs? Definitely. Africa is still a buy, um, <coughs> particularly amongst a certain group, the DFIs, mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's part of um, the work they want to do. They, the DFIs have been there from the beginning. Um, of the private equity um, industry in Africa. They're still interested in um, coming into the, the continent. And in fact, some of them have increased their funds during this crisis because they recognize that not just that there's opportunity, but there's a need. And so, and they follow where there's a need. So that, that money is still coming in. But what I also expect though, is a reawakening of domestic capital. And uh, at AFCA, that's something that we've been pushing for for a good number of years and really stoking the fire and educating domestic capital, the pension funds, insurance companies, um, et cetera, about um, the, the asset class for private equity and for venture capital. And I think that uh, I expect to see a reawakening of that as people see that um, there's been an underinvestment in certain um, infrastructure that's needed. And that's not just physical, but 
you know, the, the essential infrastructure that I've spoken about, health, education, energy, etc. And as a result of that, um, the, the opportunity that's there because of the consumer class that's there to, that now needs it more than ever. It's, it, some, so, uh, previously, some of it was in a wants and desires bucket. Now it's in a squarely in a needs bucket. And so I, I expect to see some more interest from domestic capital that now recognizes the opportunity of investing in these sectors. Amen. <laughs> uh, Justin, very interesting question, which I want to direct to you. Um, are you seeing a change in return expectations from your LPs and have you changed your return expectations in face of COVID? Not at all. Um, like I said in my previous answer, VC is a long game, uh, particularly those of us playing in the early stage. You know, we're looking for kind of order of mag, 100x type of, type of plays here. Um, uh, the actual outcomes tend to vary very broadly, but um, you know, I think, um, I think Africa is still a super exciting destination from a tech and VC point of view because it's still wildly underinvested and it's wildly underappreciated. Um, and uh, so, so, so yes, we, we, we're in a risk on risk off kind of world where the, the big ebbs and flows of, of global capital are driven by that. And exactly as Yemi said, when you're in a risk off world, you tend to feel this pullback happen. Um, but when I look at the macro scale, you know, the 10 year kind of scale that, that we operate on, you know, we're still looking for incredible companies building amazing tech that can deliver exponential results no matter what come what may and um you know i think it, it it requires you to be a little bit thoughtful you know we're a bit more focused now on on more ip driven plays rather than tech enabled um because i think great ip will always be great ip if it enables there's some technology that enables something powerful for the for the world it'll be worth a, a lot um so for us we're still hunting for the for the same thing and I hope that we can still deliver the same results over the long, the long term. I got a question which is very interesting and perhaps worth repeating verbatim. What about exits? Will better funded startups buy others? Should corporates look to scoop up bargains? How should entrepreneurs think about going it alone versus the old African proverb to go fast and go together? Justin? Yeah, so, so exits, I think, will be a little bit tricky right now um, because most exits around here tend to be trade sales, not IPOs. Um, I've felt corporates pulling back at the moment. Um, it's, it's actually my, it's always been my biggest worry about corporates playing the CVC, the corporate VC game is um, when times are good, they, they're all eager to jump in, but the minute there's a slight hiccup, they run for the hills immediately. And I've seen how that's disrupted um, deals that, that, that we've been involved in and it can mess with optics. Um, and I don't think that they're rushing to buy. I think they should be. I mean, they might find good deals right now. Um, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't be planning on having an optimal exit anytime soon. That's for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Folks, we have five minutes left. And I do want to ask you one question. And, and I want to go around the room. Let's transport ourselves to the middle of 2022. Give me one or two consumer behaviors which you feel will be permanently altered by what we are going through. And I think this will be useful both for the investors on the webinar and also for the entrepreneurs. So Kunbo, I'm, I, I'm gonna start with you. So um, I think we, are, we already seen the change in behavior that we, we're embracing a virtual world, whether that's for uh, meeting up with friends or our sports, and as we all know, working from home. I don't see a world where people are going to forego the physical completely, even in the office space. I mean, earlier this week, I tweeted that, you know, we're not robots, we're social animals, we need interaction, we need the smell of the moment. So I think there's going to be an in-between. I think we're going to see an, an uptake in our virtual relationships, um, friends, family, and our sports, and I, I will see, we will see a middle ground of working from home. Ian, one consumer behavior altered. Um, I think that um, there, there are many, so I'm trying to filter which one I think is the most important. 
to mention because I can definitely see a lot of stuff going on. But um, I think the biggest change will be with respect to capital. I think you're going to see a lot of financial institutions, um, a, a, lot, a lot less trust in financial institutions and actually um, quite a number of people will be looking at, at saving their money in other alternative assets, particularly in dollar. This is just one year from now, right? So I can say that most people, many of our economies may become fully dollarized, I would argue, um, especially in Nigeria. I think Nigeria will become a very dollarized economy in a year from now. And that, that has interesting um, implications for a lot of things that we do, including the revenue of our startups. Got it. Yemi, I picked that date to cover your trust period. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, my, my period. You know, the, one, one of the areas that, that I'm, I'm very excited about uh, is uh, education and, and specifically e-learning. Uh, but I think what we have here is, the, is a coming out party for e-learning, uh, frankly. I mean, all of us who have young kids at home, of course, are complaining about homeschooling and the fact that we, are, we also have to do all of this work and check their homework and so on and so forth. But uh, at the end of the day, for us to, uh, if we look at Africa specifically, to, to really get good quality education uh, scaled, you have to do it electronically, right? I mean, like, there's no way we can build enough physical schools to be able to do it to reverse what is, uh, frankly, a very worrying trend in the decline of the quality of education. So e-learning is, is the way to do it. I think uh, many people who are skeptical about it uh, are seeing that you can actually uh, make it work, uh, even, even in these emerging markets that don't necessarily have the best bandwidth and, and so forth. So, so I think this is really uh, gonna be the, the coming out party for, for e-learning. Justin. Yeah, so I, firstly, I'm delighted that so many more people have discovered Zoom and learned how to use it. Uh, so <laughs> maybe there'll be a few less unnecessary plane trips and, and so on in my future, um, which I think is a positive. Sorry, my, my lights keep going out. There's something wrong with the, with the lights in my office for some reason. We can see. Um, we can see. Okay. Um, I think we're going to see... Uh, I think consumers are, have been quite burnt. I think we're going to see a, a desire for deleveraging and household balance sheet repair. Um, I think a lot of people went into this with, with you know, debts, monthly debits, um, and they've suddenly faced a very uncertain future where they may have been furloughed or they may have had their salaries chopped in half or lost their jobs entirely. And they're sitting with all these liabilities um, and it's, it's pretty scary and there's no end in sight. So I, I think, you know, you, there's a bit of psychological scarring there, and we saw it after 2008 as well. You know, people are less inclined to leverage up, take on debts. Um, so, you know, as to what the sort of actual impact of that may be in the lending space or in, uh, you know, uh, consumer sales that rely on, on those elements, it'll be interesting to see. But there's, there's always a period of caution and personal deleveraging that follows these types of personal financial scares, I feel. Thank you, Justin. Arjuna, you want to wrap things up for us? Sure, I mean, uh, I'd like to wrap by first thanking our panelists. Uh, it was so many insights. Um, so much wise counsel from them. Um, and as it was clear, these people are calls and you're getting a well notes. We try to address as many of your questions as we could. Apologies if we didn't get to them. Um, we will have a recording that we'll put up on our website if you want to go back and try and you know catch some more of the insights uh, that may have gone by quickly. Please feel free to do that. Um, first of all, it was clear that everybody said, please stay safe. Take care of yourselves, take care of your family, your teams, and your customers. Um, on an optimistic note, there will be winners in various subsectors. So be creative and flexible as entrepreneurs. Conserve cash, be very disciplined about expenses. And if you can raise in this market, don't be sensitive about valuation. Play the long game. 
it's clear that invest again, folks, thank you so much for joining us, taking their time to, to spend uh, with us this afternoon virtually um, sharing their insights. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you.